and welcome to Unlearning Economics. Um, I have with me today Trevon D. Logan, who I'm very excited to talk to about issues uh, pertaining to race and economics, as well as maybe some other subjects if we if we have a chance to get to it. So Trevon, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to me. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so your your research is very wide ranging um, into you know various areas of African American history, among other things. Uh, but if I had to sum it up from my reading, I'd say that you've you've basically disputed a lot of the accepted narratives about key areas of African American history through your research. Um, and I suppose a good a good place to start would be your work on segregation in rural areas and 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 lynchings because. You know, when we talk about segregation, we often think of like redlining and we think of cities, don't we, and towns and, um, you know, uh, black and white areas being segregated. Uh, but this ignores a, a really big story of how it developed and changed in rural areas. Yes, I think, you know, there's several different interventions I've made in segregation, but one that I think uh, struck me is actually at a theoretical level, which led to the empirical work, which is there isn't a theory of segregation that would make its effects exclusive to urban areas. So we have this you know, huge body of literature looking at segregation only in urban areas, and there's nothing that would limit it to urban areas except for the fact that we measure segregation in urban areas. So it's one of those curious cases where there truly is measurement uh, without theory, and that poses some problems for what we'd want to do to think about the effects of segregation. If we're looking and thinking about segregation, particularly in rural areas, we have to take account of the fact that the majority of African Americans were in rural areas until the 1950 census. And so if we're talking about this large scale process of race in America, we're actually leaving the majority of African American people out of it if we're focusing on historical dimensions of segregation only in cities. So there are multiple dimensions in which we should think theoretically and then empirically about bringing those areas in because rural areas are particularly important. And so that was disruptive to the existing narrative which had built this entire body of work just really thinking about um, urban areas. Yeah, one of the things that we find is it doesn't change dramatically or there isn't a large urban rural difference in these patterns of segregation, historical patterns of segregation. And I think that is the most significant. If we really look closely at the literature, there is an implicit assumption that the rural areas have no changes in segregation and that segregation would not be related to outcomes, right? That's sort of an implicit way in which if you look at the empirical literature, they'll use, for example, racial proportions uh, in a county, say a rural county, as a measure of segregation. And what we were able to show is that looking at the percentage of a county that is Black is actually a very poor predictor of its actual segregation patterns. So the typical proxies that we use that we think are going to explain this pattern don't work at all. But at a more personal level, I was really um, drawn to and, and thought of this work in conversations with my paternal grandmother as we were talking about the census records and realizing that in a rural area in Mississippi in 1930, she grew up in a relatively integrated community relative to the community that I grew up in in an urban area in the 1980s. And that got me thinking about how we could develop a consistent measure of segregation that would really capture at a granular level that residential sorting process because it wouldn't be different, uh, as I said earlier, between rural and urban areas. So, I mean, it, it's fair to say the, the conventional narrative of like, of white flight was confined to to uh, to urban areas sorry wasn't it um but th this also happened this also happened in rural areas 
Yeah, and I think that the issue there is we would not necessarily call it, you know, white flight if it's happening in a rural area. So they're not fleeing necessarily from one rural area to another rural area. Mm. What we see in these rural areas is an increase in the racial sorting in rural areas. And so a large story in the urban literature is the creation of suburbs, right? So taking areas that were previously rural and incorporating them into the metropolitan area and these areas, these outlying areas outside of the central city becoming predominantly white while the urban core um, becomes increasingly black and the implications of that, which have been explored in some very exciting new research. What I was able to find with historical segregation is that that pattern of racial sorting occurs, but without a suburbanization process, right? So our, our traditional narrative, which is sort of hewed to the ways in which cities became larger and then racially segregated and increased in the racial segregation, doesn't tell the story of the United States because we see the same racial sorting process in rural areas that did not undergo the suburbanization process. And I think that is more interesting because it tells us that these segregation patterns are actually quite general and generalizable. And therefore the traditional explanations which hinge on an urban landscape cannot be sufficient to explain the segregation patterns that we've observed in the data. So could, could you maybe give us a bit more of an idea of like what, what this renewed focus on rural areas and how they changed, what this implies for how racism evolved and developed and maybe even for today? Yeah, there's a couple of pieces that um, I've worked on with uh, my co-authors, Lisa Cook and John Parman. And the first is thinking about the relationship between racial sorting um, in the United States more generally, right? So rural and urban areas and its relationship to racial violence. There's a lot of theory about the relationship between racial segregation and lynching, for example, but we didn't have a good empirical way of measuring segregation in rural areas. And so with the segregation measure, we were able to empirically estimate this relationship. And we find that segregation is a very strong predictor of lynchings historically from 1880 to, 19, to the 1930s. And that applies equally to rural and urban areas. So there's something about that racial sorting, which is related to racialized violence and strongly related to black lynchings, not white lynchings. So it's not just about violence, it's about racialized violence. In another paper with Rodney Andrews, Marcus Casey and Bradley Hardy, we look at this relationship between historical segregation and the intergenerational mobility um, that's been documented by Chetty, Hedren, and, and a series of co-authors at Opportunity Insights. And what we find there is that historical segregation, when I say historical segregation, I mean segregation as measured in the 1880 census. And that segregation, that level of segregation, is related to, negatively related to, intergenerational mobility, uh, literally more than 100 years later. So if you take the contemporary sort of uh, narrative that segregation in cities measured, say, in the 1960s or 1970s being related to intergenerational mobility, we're really opening up a new avenue of research to think about the historical dimensions of place where the segregation patterns by race are measured 100 years before we're thinking about even the beginnings of the measurement of intergenerational mobility. So remember in that Chetty and Hedren uh, piece, those children are born in 1980. So they're literally born 100 years after segregation is measured. And we still see this relationship between that historical measure of segregation and those children's mobility with their you know, intergenerational mobility with their parents. So thinking now about what it means to be in these highly segregated environments that were historically segregated as well, I think is a very important dimension. So I think that I appreciate this is a massive question. And in a way, I'm basically asking you to summarize all of your research. But like, what what are some of the mechanisms that that make this this correlation uh, between segregation 100 years ago and social mobility now um, a, a reality? You know, this is the unanswered question, right? So this is the sort of thing that I'm still thinking really deeply uh, about. What I can say is we ruled out some things, right, in terms of explaining the segregation patterns and the increases in segregation patterns. So it's not about, for example, 
um, or it's not driven by counties that African Americans leave or the counties that African Americans you know migrate to over time. That doesn't explain the increasing segregation uh, pattern. Um, it is related to and correlated with some antebellum. Uh, correlates, but so are so many other things because antebellum factors lead to disproportionate numbers of African American people in some areas versus others. And so we're able to rule out some explanations for this increase in segregation, but we are not able to um, directly look at the mechanisms at this point. We do have some things that I think would I would put into the, the box of conjecture. And we can think about that in a place like, say, New York. So one of the advantages of the segregation measure, and let me back up and, and, and talk about the measure itself, the measure looks at households um, and households by household. So it's looking at a household and looking at the race of your neighbor and using that as the building block of a measure of segregation. That's one reason why it can apply to rural and urban areas is that we don't need the geographic identifiers or census blocks that are used in traditional measures. And when you do it that way, you can take a city like New York and look at its segregation patterns over time by boroughs of the city. And what we're able to look at is the likelihood that say a white household has a black neighbor and the likelihood that a black household has a white neighbor. So if you do this by borough in say New York City, you'll find that as African-Americans increase as a share of residents of Manhattan, the likelihood that a white household has a black neighbor and the likelihood that a black household has a white neighbor decreases dramatically over time, even as the African-American population in Manhattan is increasing. So what we're really seeing is this process where cities and rural areas are really increasing in their sorting, right? So in other words, these areas are becoming black areas over time. And that also means by default that areas are becoming white over time. So there really is at this basic level an increase in segregation in the United States between 1880 and 1940 that is really at the household level. And this is before we start thinking about the second great migration and other sorts of factors that might be uh, involved in this and large scale suburbanization and the interstate and all these other factors. So something is happening at the household level that is increasing racial sorting in the late 19th to the early 20th century. So that's the one thing that we know is happening. Now, what are the reasons for that? That gets even more curious. You know, we don't have at that point in time the federal infrastructure, for example, backing how home mortgages. We don't have, um, for example, the investment in infrastructure in terms of interstates, which we know were related to the suburbanization process and led to land dispossession for African-Americans. So it's really unclear what was driving that process over that period of time, but it was something that we see all over the nation in every region of the nation is this new sorting process and increasing sorting by race. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. This is a really, really fine-grained um, measure of, of segregation, right? Um, you know, much more fine-grained than perhaps perhaps ones we've seen before. Um, I, I want to, like, semi-pivot to something, and then I think we might come back to this question, but I want to talk about one of your other studies, um, which I really loved, which looked at cotton picking um, in, in within your own family, right, to... Um, and, and what you did was you kind of looked at productivity rates and you used it to ask a number of questions, including the psychological um, effects of this, but also to question the distinction between slavery and emancipation. Yeah, you know, this is, um, <laughs> you bring this to mind, this is a project that's just taken way too long <laughs> in, my, in my life uh, to, <laughs> to really write it on. And the ideas that come about in that project, and I want to give a, a big sort of poster board uh, advertisement are really coming from the humanities. Um, a, a book that I think every economist, and certainly every economist thinking about uh, issues of race should read is Hartman's Scenes of Subjection. And that book, which is humanistic, she's a literary theorist, she's a professor of English. But the point that she's making is that after emancipation, really is this contested freedom, which is a continuation of this racial project. 
And so we think about emancipation, and, and, and she doesn't say that emancipation didn't occur. But we have to think about the dimensions in which we celebrate emancipation without realizing its very limited nature on the lives of Black people in, in general, and the way that race forms and reforms in the United States. And thinking about that and, and, and highlighting the work that she is using really about this sort of contested individuality that we see that I think really needs to be um, interrogated in economic theory got me thinking about the lives that African-American people, including people very close to me and my own family, have lived that are not very distant from antebellum facts about the Black experience in the United States. And so we draw this very sharp and, and bright line in 1865 with the 13th Amendment and the end of chattel slavery in the United States. But I think the social line that we draw, and frankly, the economic line that we draw, is actually much um, more dull and it's much fuzzier. And the narrative histories have always highlighted this. But I think that in economics, because we're taking such an international and say development approach and we think about extension of the franchise, et cetera, et cetera, as being these sort of unending uh, marches towards greater democratization, that doesn't happen in the American case. And so when we're looking at this and we think about things, we have to really ask some very particular and American-centric questions. It is very rare in the history of democracies to have a democratizing process to enfranchise a very large group of people, millions of people, literally, and then subsequently in the course of 15 years, disenfranchise them through a process that was not a revolution or the establishment of a new government. That is a really particular thing that happened in the United States to African-American people. And we don't talk about it as the curious reversal of democracy that it was. And I link that to the discussions that we have today about democracy and the threats to democracy that we're seeing, the threats to enfranchisement. And we talk about them as if they've never occurred before and how uh, shocking these events are. But they're actually perennials in America if we view it through the history of African-American politics. This is not the first time that we've seen threats to democracy. And frankly, it would not be the first time if we have anti-democratic institutions established that we've had them in this country. This is not unique, um, this period of time that we're talking about now. What we have to do is tell the true history of what happened in the Reconstruction era to get these pieces correct when we talk about what's happening today. And so people are beginning to draw those parallels, but I was a bit disturbed um, or perhaps disappointed that it's taken so long for people to draw those very clear lines between the experiences between 1865 and say 1880 and what is occurring now in say the post 2000, the last 20 years or so in American politics. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I suppose maybe a slightly glib way of summarizing it would be two steps forward, one step back, right? And um, you had the initial emancipation um, and then the backlash. I mean, this gives me a chance to ask about your research on, on um, black politicians as well, because I think there's a really interesting, you have some interesting findings about during that period, uh, what they achieved, especially in terms of racial inequality um, but that's another area where there was a conventional narrative told about it that you've you've questioned yeah you know it, it was um, a very interesting uh, project and once again you know using the work of historians who have been uh, um, traditional historians narrative historians who've been very valuable to this project and so if we think about reconstruction one of the things that always strikes me about that and I'm going to go into a little bit of the historiography here because I think it's very important is that the narrative was that Reconstruction was a failure. And so going back to what I was mentioning earlier about establishing American democracy, democratizing and extending the franchise to African-American men at the time as full citizens, as establishing their birthright citizenship in the United States. If you think about what the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments to the constitution did, really, establishing American democracy. And I want to put a pin in this point, and I'm going to come back to it. And this is something that actually recently, you know, all of these things are just coming back again. So recently in the Supreme Court, 
Judge uh, Jackson, Supreme Court Justice Jackson, was arguing, of course, uh, and making the point that these amendments were race-specific. And these were race-specific remedies to a very race-specific problem in the United States in terms of enslavement. The purpose of those amendments was to attempt to address the racially specific political position of formerly enslaved people after the 13th Amendment and their rights, fundamental rights as American citizens. It is a very race-conscious solution to a race-conscious uh, problem. And to see it now painted in this race-neutral term uh, by you know, very, very conservative justices is really an ahistorical narrative. You wouldn't need a 14th and 15th Amendment if you didn't have a racialized politics of enfranchisement before that time. We forget that African-American political enfranchisement did not cleave on the issue of enslavement. It cleaved on the issue actually of race. And so it was really important um, when uh, Justice Jackson made that point to really drive home the history that we have in this country about that specific process. The next piece of that and thinking about that is, well, what did that political enfranchisement actually do? Like what happened? And if you're thinking in very general terms, and I'm not a political scientist, but I'll be a really bad one right now, <laughs> We think about what happens when people of particular demographics are elected to office. And if we take a really, you know, bare bones version of the median voter theorem, there really should be no effect of the politician's demographics on their actual policies, right? They would just reflect the voting and, and the aspirations of the voting public and the median voter. But what I find in my project looking at black politicians is that they really did, in the narrative record, articulate a very specific set of policies where they had broad agreement and they were trying to bring them into action in their policies. One of the things that they saw and understood was that they needed to have a wealth redistribution channel in order for African-American political objectives to be achieved. The South had, and we know this from the work they have Carrie Lee Merritt and others, a highly unequal wealth distribution irrespective of race, right? So take all of the uh, enslaved people, take all of the free blacks out of it, just looking at whites in the South, there was a high level of, of inequality there. And black politicians were trying to address this through traditional ways in which we would redistribute wealth, which would be through the tax system. And they were trying to lead to areas of black wealth acquisition, in particular in the 19th century, this would have been through the form of land. And so looking at that in the narrative record and then able to match that to county level tax data and see that black officials were related to increased um, tax revenue in the areas where they were serving above and beyond what the voting shares in those local areas would suggest says something about the particular policy objectives based upon the actual politicians demographics, not just the demographics of the voting population. And so they were effective, which again goes back against this traditional narrative that reconstruction was a failure, that black politicians were ineffective, and that black political efficacy um, was really not particularly strong in the reconstruction time period. And so my empirical evidence uh, goes against those narratives, which still hold a great deal of sway in the way that reconstruction is taught, say in high schools, and even say in a survey course in American history. So really interrogating that I think is necessary to understand what was achieved in a very short period of time. And that actually highlights what failed to be achieved after the end of that democratic process and the end of reconstruction, redemption, and the racial violence that followed thereafter. So, um, so yeah, I mean, could maybe, so I'm from the UK, um, obviously, right, and um, some of my audiences as well. So I was just wondering if you could say maybe a little bit more about that conventional narrative and maybe what is taught in American high schools, because I don't, I don't really know. Um, what, what's the idea of reconstruction that just not, nothing was really achieved? It was kind of a period of stagnation. Is that how it's depicted? 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's depicted typically as a failure, right? So in other words, what, what you were trying to do was take this formerly enslaved group of people, bring them into the democratic process, let them be involved in policy making, and then achieve some objectives that would have led to um, increased socioeconomic position uh, for African Americans. And none of that allegedly was, was achieved. What we know now is that a lot of that actually was achieved, but there actually was retrenchment after, right? So some of my results look at this very um, basic fact. Looking at where black politicians were serving in office and you look at 1870 tax revenue, it's actually quite high. So the areas where black officials are serving, there was more redistribution in those places. And if you look from 1870 to 1880, you'll see the places where black officials were serving in 1870. By 1880, those places have significantly lower tax revenue because they reversed their policies. You don't have a reversal unless you've actually had some policy efficacy in the first place. So there are two things to really show about that, which is not only was the black political power, black political power was effective, and there was a vicious white response to that efficacy of black policy. And it was violent and it completely unended not only the political participation of black people, but also the policy objectives that they were able to achieve in a short period of time. So there really is, so in the end, reconstruction is a failure, but it's not a failure because of the black politicians. It's not a failure because black voters were ineffective in getting their policy objectives achieved. It was a failure because it was allowed to fail given the lack of federal intervention to protect black voting rights and the abject violence that white citizens were able to engage in undeterred against black voters and black politicians jointly. So when you say there was a reversal, are we talking about a situation where you you basically went back to what it had been before, or are we talking about a situation where it actually ended up worse than it than it was before the period of reconstruction? It, it, the best I can estimate is going from say 1870, 1880, and then going in, in, in reverse. And it is a complete reversal. So it goes back to what it was before. It's really difficult to draw that line before the antebellum period because of course we have enslavement before that time. So I, I don't, I wanna be very clear that I'm not saying we go back to an enslaved regime, but I do want to be clear that this is a reversal from what was achieved in the few years right after emancipation. Yeah, uh, and this this was so this was achieved mostly through some of the things that uh, we we discussed at the beginning. You know, just based like terror enacted upon the the black population and lynchings and threatenings of um, of uh, black politicians and things like that. Right. Yes. Yes. And what I've been able to find actually is uh, in, a, in a related um, paper is that. The violence against black politicians, and I want to say this, you know, the murder rate among black politicians is absolutely astronomical. 10% of black politicians met with some level of, of, of violence, and many of them were killed. So this level of actually the murder of politicians was extensive. It, it is the highest murder rate that I've ever seen for any black demographic who have very high rates of homicide. But what we see is that the black politicians who were met with violence, physical violence, threats of intimidation, up to and including being murdered, were the ones who served in areas that had the most redistributed policies. So the political violence against black politicians is empirically related to their political efficacy in terms of redistributing wealth. So we see this relationship, and we don't talk about this uh, in, in history. And in fact, one of the reasons for this reversal is because it was so effective. The places where black politicians were effective and were redistributing well were the places where they were more likely to be violently thrown out and killed relative to other places, even other places where black politicians were, were serving. So the violence meted out against black politicians is directly related to their political efficacy. Mm. yeah one in one in ten that is uh that is that is an absolutely astonishing murder rate and then yeah if you were uh an especially active or effective black politician in your pol policies then presumably the rate was even higher right 
um that is yes. quite amazing i mean it, i'm kind of reluctant to bring this up but it's it's probably the most popular economics book in the world um there's this section of free economics that i actually saw pop up recently and i don't know i know you're on twitter i don't know if you saw this pop mm -hmm. up but they they have a section where they really play down the the importance of lynchings because they say they were a small proportion of the black population as a whole and they say the kkk was i mean it is i i trying to keep my self together while i'm describing this but like <laughs> it's they say the kkk was basically just a sorry fraternity of men it was like a sad boys club are you familiar with this did you see it pop up on twitter and you know do you have any thoughts on it <laughs> You know, I, I'm not as deeply an expert on uh, the 20th century clan, which is what they're using in that particular um, paper. And I think it's very important not to conflate uh, so many pieces. The Ku Klux Klan was certainly involved in racial violence, and they were very involved in the racial and reconstruction violence that I was just speaking about. The clan morphs in many different ways. And there are two things that I think um, we can interrogate with that particular research project. One is the lynching data that they use. And I really would want to defer um, to my colleague, Lisa Cook, who's now a governor of the Federal Reserve Board System. So good luck getting her on your show. But, um, <laughs> but she really is uh, the expert on the lynching data. Uh, and they don't use the traditional uh, lynching data in that particular exercise. But also they're looking at a new form of the Ku Klux Klan, which may or may not have engaged in the same level of racial violence. But if you look at alternative measures, such as sundown towns, which are towns where African Americans were not welcome at all, those overlap with the places of intense Klan activity. Indiana, for example, is a place that has a lot of 20th century Klan activity and has a disproportionate number of, of these sundown towns, these sort of places where African Americans cannot go. And so, the relationship between just lynching doesn't tell us something about a much larger process that would still be hewed to clan involvement. And so I think it's really important to draw from the historical narratives about the various dimensions of racial oppression when you tell stories about the clan. And I think one of the issues that I face as a researcher in this area is that we have these really strong priors which are driven by media representations driven by accepted wisdom that just don't match with the historical narrative. And so it's a call to bring in new data, but also to think really freshly about the ways in which we think these racial processes operate. It's not always the case that you need extensive racial violence or race riots to achieve your objectives. You have to think then, what is the purpose of one lynching? If you think about it today, what's the purpose or what is the effect of one officer involved homicide or police killing? We know from contemporary evidence that a police killing is related to poor performance of children in schools, higher rates of anxiety in uh, and among black people in the local area. And so we have to then think about a broader dimension in which this racial violence is occurring and whether or not we have the historical tools and data available to measure those effects. So I, I, um, I don't want to talk too closely about that, but I do want to bring up those issues of one about interpretation of what they're finding, as opposed to just the, the data and empirical evidence itself. There really is this other question of interpretation, which I think filters through a much broader social process where we have these accepted wisdoms and we're trying to, for example, find a counterintuitive result for, uh, for what have you. And I think that can pose some problems. Yeah, that's a really ex excellent summary. I mean, I think, yeah, history can tell us about the context and in, in this case, how the KKK changed um, and also whether the measures we're using are correct, right? And I mean, this seems like a good opportunity to talk about what I'd consider a parallel project or a, a, a part of the same project that runs through your research, which is that you've really emphasized the importance of qualitative research um, over just quantitative research, in, in especially in the case of race and, and uh, American history, but also more generally. Yes, and it, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to be 
as concise as possible because this is really something I, I, I think uh, strongly about and I don't want to get uh, on, on my lectern uh, here in this in this conversation. But there are a couple of reasons why I think we want to bring in qualitative evidence. The first is really drawing from what I've been influenced by, which is the work of Dorothy Roberts, which is that we think about race as being a social category because that's how we record it in data, right? What's your racial identity and tell me what you, what you are, what you are not. And we can think about race. And so there's the cutting edge now of economics is to say that race is a social, social construction. So uh, economists enter this conversation quite late. I think uh, a sociologist or political scientist probably roll their eyes at such a contention. Like it's really, it's really 2022 and you're saying something that's pretty unremarkable. <laughs> But the issue about it being a social construction is that's not, it doesn't tell us very much, right? Why is race socially constructed and what does it do? What does the social construction actually do? And that is a question that economists just cannot answer, right? So we think we have race, we say race is a social construction, but social constructions have to serve a purpose, right? So the counter example I give to this is, you know, money is a social construction. I never hear monetary economists talk about money being socially constructed. They continue to talk about what money does, right? What money allows you to do in an economy, et cetera, right? If we're thinking about the Federal Reserve and monetary policy, we are talking about money. We are talking about a social construction, but they're not talking about it as a social construction. They're talking about it as something that's going to have a real and material impact on people's lives, whether or not tight monetary policy or loose monetary policy will lead to inflation or lead to a recession, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're talking about real things that are related to this social construction. So if we're talking about race and being socially constructed, we still have to decide what race actually does and what it means. And so Dorothy Roberts has convinced me that race is not just the social category and it's not just a historical thing. There are two parts of it. It is a political construction as well. And that's really important because then it tells us that race is something that is used to redistribute goods and services across different groups of people. And race being political makes it two things. It makes it one, inherently economic because we exist in a political economy. We're not just doing political things on their own. They're related to people's material living conditions. So if race is a political measure then that means it's inherently an economic measure. And the second is, given that our politics are dynamic, that means race is also a dynamic process. Now, I would add to that that race is an experience. And so race is this political experience that varies over time and potentially across space. And that is not going to be captured in the social statistics that we measure. It just will not be captured that way. So we have to go back then to the qualitative measure to answer those particular pieces of what race actually means. And so it's not that I think that the quantitative data um, is poor, and although in some cases it definitely is, it's that the quantitative data is simply not up to the task of answering the questions about race that we'd like to answer in economics. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, this notion, I, I suppose when you, if you think about it from a, a very traditional economist point of view, you'd get race in a regression, right? And you'd code it, you know, mm -hmm. zero, zero if you're um, not African-American and one if you're African-American. And then you'd look at the effect of that on, you know, some outcome like income, for instance. Uh, but, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the way I the way I interpreted what you were saying is that that what, number one you can't treat that category as fixed over time. It doesn't represent the same thing um, over time. Um, and I think number two, I suppose there's there's these ongoing two way interactions between that category and you know all a lot of other categories around it, including income, including whatever dependent variable you have. Um, that would make it really difficult for like the assumptions of econometrics to be satisfied. It, it, exactly. I just think that we, it's a much more difficult process and in fact careful process that we would want to attach to our thinking about that race variable, that race measure. Um, than what we traditionally would see in economics. And so, you know, we have, you know, discrete categories have 
clear advantages in many different ways, right? Discrete categories are tractable. You can put them into regressions, for example. They tell you something. They can measure some sort of average uh, effect. But I think, and I want to be very careful in what I'm saying, I think the matching of our social statistics on race with the um, unending and unyielding <laughs> desire among economists to have causal inference is leading us down to an intellectually vacuous space. You're not going to get causal effects of race. And the reason you're not going to get causal effects of race is because race is an experiential thing. And it's not something that is germane to the potential outcomes framework. It just doesn't work that way. Just stop. It does not work that way. Thinking about causal effects of race obviates a need to discuss deeper practices such as racialization. And so I'm really worried at the new cutting edge of this work of marrying this to a causal inference framework. I just don't think, and I think this is where economists and their lack of understanding about race is really um, showing itself uh, to be problematic. Let me, you know, not just lock that side, let me lock this other side of people who think that they can capture elements of structural racism in uh, these other sorts of um, more statistical uh, measures. And that is not going to work either. <laughs> um, and that's why I think that we really do need the qualitative evidence. I think that if I'm looking at this overall, the one thing I would say to social scientists more generally is we have got to unlock and undo this belief that higher level process in social science is going to be quantitative and then underneath that is some sort of qualitative stuff. That is not going to be a generative approach to really understanding and documenting race and racialization processes in the United States. Yeah, I think even when I talk to economists who are kind of sympathetic to qualitative methods, they sort of, they see it as like the preamble, right? It's like, okay, we did some qualitative stuff, but now let's get to the real, the real meat and bones of it and let's run a regression and let's, you know, do a, a some kind of difference in difference or something like that. But I think what you're, you're saying is, is much deeper. Like we, we really can't understand and study race, you know, in this way. Um, I, I mean, one, you're reminding me of um, uh, stratification economics, right, which uh, has been popularized by people like Kyle Moore, as well as, well as yourself, uh, Lisa Cook. Um, and uh, that talks about this process of like racialization. And I think one of the things it draws attention to, which may be the more traditional theories like statistical discrimination or, or, or taste-based discrimination, which maybe you can talk about if you want, um, which, which they don't do, is that it, it emphasizes how that category of race has served um, powerful people such as employers and how splitting, for example, black and white workers into different groups um, has served them. And that tells you a lot about how race works and how it emerged. Yes, and one of the great things about stratification is it brings into the economics framework. If you think about sort of when you're traditionally taught economics and you learn microeconomic theory, right, at undergraduate level, graduate level, what have you, people don't have identities in those models, right? You don't see white people in economic models. You don't see black people in economic models. You, don't, you just see people, perhaps a household, who have preferences and they have these um, conditions that give you rationalizable preferences, etc. So there's no group identity there. And bringing that identity in is very important for stratification because group identity can bring about utility to people, even if they themselves don't have the average material benefits of people in their group. Right. So you know this brings up these notions that come from other disciplines like property rights. In, in whiteness and other notions of group identity being important and salient into how people make decisions about the world. And in particular, one of the things, of course, that stratification brings up is this political process, right? So it marries this idea about race being political in a very explicit way because group identity is very important to individuals. And this is racial group identity. It also allows for, and I think 
one of the things I'm really excited about stratification economics being able to speak to is the process of racialization itself. And this goes back to one of these limits of sort of thinking about the data that people use, the quantitative data that people use, is that very different people have become white over time. And that is not something that these contemporary studies of race have brought into, into really, really deep consideration. If we're thinking about these sociological models that look at structural racism, if we're thinking about these models that want to think about causal effects of race, we really have to understand that group identity and this racialization process is really dynamic because groups are allowed into whiteness. And that itself is a fascinating process that is not going to be captured. But why would you allow people into whiteness and not allow people into whiteness? That's not going to be explained by an individual level model. It really is about group power and group dynamics that explains these sort of larger social processes that I think economists want to speak to, but I don't think our traditional theoretical apparatus is up to the task of explaining those sort of facts. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. So when you say groups of people who have been brought into whiteness, um, I'm wondering who you have in mind. I mean, I'm, I think of like maybe Italian Americans, or is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Oh, a whole lot, a whole lot of people that we now think of as white were not white, right? Like you know, historically in the United States, right? So um, this could include even Irish, right? Irish people, right? And so they weren't white people, right? So th these are really, really, really important. Um, understandings. Eastern Europeans were not white. For a large extent, people, particularly say Italians or Spaniards who, who were Catholic, were not white um, in the traditional sense. And they become white over time, both through limited amounts of intermarriage, but also through gaining access to white institutions. And a part of that is reifying the anti blackness that is important to becoming white. Right. And so it's about group identity and then sharing group identity, particularly with reference to outgroup members. Right. That process is not, you know, it's not like there's this, this committee on whiteness that sits in Washington, D.C. and decides which groups are white over time. But if you look at our racial classifications about who is white, you'd be surprised who's included in whiteness in the United States in the federal government's definition of whiteness. And there are people now attempting to get out of whiteness, right, because they see the problems um, of being um, adhered to in that. And so I've given some uh, talks about sort of those census definitions of whiteness, which are really curious about who is placed into these uh, places and how race is identified. And I would just say one more thing about that, because race is not given by descendant status, except for the case of indigenous uh, people, right? And it's, a, it's it is absolutely fascinating how race is defined in our social statistics. And it's not something that's been carefully interrogated, certainly by economists who sort of take them off the shelf and use them. But if you think about that process and it has it occurs over time, there's a great story to be told about whiteness itself, just in the way that we've defined it as a social category over time. Yeah, I mean, I made the title of this uh, chat Race, Power and Economics, and I do think it's interesting what you said there about how, you know, these categories are, are designed um, and then economists kind of take them off the shelf. And I think it's another reason to be skeptical of, of a purely quantitative approach, because um, you just get statistics that basically reflect, you know, the, the definitions of the powerful. And I think even more so what you often have is that, you know, some statistics aren't gathered, you know, some, something that could be gathered that is important, um, perhaps pertains to the issue of race, is not gathered because it's not a priority for those in power. And I think that's something that maybe you've wrestled with in your research when you've, you've delved into these, these sort of um, gaps, you know, these, these areas where, where there's just, there's not enough data um, and there's not enough said about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently working on um, a, a, a larger project, and, and one of the pieces of this is, is the data that we use and the stories that we tell. Because I think it's very important to understand that certainly economists tell a lot of stories. And, and this is you know, my biggest complaint about sort of this causal inference framework and, and other sorts of things that people want to adapt to this race, race process and race research agenda, is that all of it still leads back to narratives, right? Any inference you're drawing from the data that you're talking about 
is not a statistical exercise. That's a narrative exercise. And so we're still fundamentally, right? And, and, and I just want everyone to understand this. Fundamentally, what we're doing, even as researchers, particularly in the social sciences, is we are still telling stories. We are still operating ultimately in a narrative framework. And so we have to be very careful then if we're telling stories and we use words like evidence-based, and I'm using my, my air quotes as I talk about this, evidence-based and rigorous analysis and all these other sorts of catchphrases that people use. Mm. Those are just devices that would tell people that the narrative is more believable than other narratives that people would have. Like that's, that's the only thing that you're doing. You're doing this hierarchy that people may or may not believe when you're doing this. But ultimately, you're telling stories. The story that you're telling is only as good if you're one of these types of researchers as the data that you're using to tell the story. And time and again, I am finding that the data is incomplete. There are alternative explanations for the narratives that are out there that are just not considered. And the reason for their consideration or their lack of consideration is typically much more aligned to the social organization of economists than it is any sort of um, hierarchy of data or methodology uh, that's in play there. And so I don't, I'm, I hate to be pessimistic about this point, but we're still telling stories. And the stories that get believed are believed because of who's telling them. And they're believed because of a, a tacit belief that there's some sort of hierarchy in which stories are most believable versus others, which I think ultimately still puts as a secondary or tertiary objective, listening to the stories and listening to the narratives that Black people have about themselves. I still think that is a missing piece of certainly the economic history agenda, and I think more generally in the economics research agenda as well. I mean, it's interesting that you, you, yeah, you mentioned um, economic history there, because I, I saw your review of um, The Half Has Never Been Told, uh, and uh, which is a book which I think it was released a little while ago now in 2014, which basically uh, put slavery and colonialism broadly at the center of the emergence of capitalism. <coughs> and um, it, it, you, you wrote quite a critical review of it, which I think was along the lines that you've just said, um, not maybe not centering the voices of slaves, for instance, maybe neglecting the cultural dimension um, of slavery. Yeah, I, I think... Typically, and, and, and this is just a, a more general issue in history and race uh, more particularly, is we typically want to have a story that is, that is told. And when we're letting African-American people speak, it, it typically is very constrained. If you really get into this and start digging around, you're going to find a much less homogeneous group of Black people <laughs> uh, than you would typically assert uh, exist. Another piece of this, and, and there are some political scientists who are really delving into this, is that what you'll see is also that we, we map on the majority or say the white political spectrum and we assume that the same sort of spectrum adopts to other communities. And that's just a failure to recognize the individual uh, diversity in the black community itself, but also in the ways in which it manifests itself and which sort of political objectives would have larger audiences in the black community versus in the larger um, Amer in American society more generally. And so I'm always struck by the way in which we have this mapping, which really goes back to a fundamental question that I sort of asked in, in, in a recent piece I had in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. We are fundamentally in social science still trying to answer this question that was put forward by, by Gutman in a review of uh, Fogel and Ingerman's Time on the Cross. What do black people know how do they know it? And who do they learn what they know from, right? Those are fundamental questions that I don't think social science has carefully interrogated in general about Black people. We still have a preponderance of models and conceptual frameworks in social science where Black people are largely imitative of, of white people. And that is deeply dissatisfying, I think, and it should be deeply dissatisfying for any social scientist to just assume that black people, once again, and who are black people, we have to answer this race question again beyond race being a social construct, other than being, you know, darker skinned white people. That doesn't, that's not going to work. 
But yet, if you really interrogate many of the things that we do, that's exactly what we assume. And that's deeply uh, unsatisfying. It is, it is quite incredible, I think, quite how much, quite how prevalent the assumption, or pervasive, I should say, the assumption that you're highlighting is. Um, because just the lack of attention to, for example, the, you know, testimonies of, 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 of slaves and the voices of slaves, uh, it, it's, it's something that I just, I find comes up again and again. Um, and it's something that we, I think, you know, as, as economists, as academics, we should be really, really ruthlessly interrogating these, these gaps in our knowledge, but we're, we're not doing it anywhere near enough. Yeah, I think um, it, it's going to take a lot of work. It's one of the reasons why I push for, of course, diversity in the profession, because I think it brings forward these these voices. You know, for, for example, um, a, a paper that's recently come out that I'm incredibly excited about and, and a research agenda that I'm incredibly excited about is Jacoba Williams of American University, who's found this relationship between historical lynchings and contemporary voter education among African-Americans. And Jacoba's work is so important because she's going back to the history and not looking at lynching as just something that's related to social control or clan membership or even segregation, but thinking about its political consequences and what it does and how it operates and persists over time. And that's just a new approach for thinking about how these processes work on the ground. And it's brought by Jacoba and her experiences and the way in which she's viewing these issues of political economy. And so we're going to have a more robust and I think a more diverse, and I mean intellectually diverse, research agenda on race as we increase the diversity of, of the profession. Um, it, it does, it shouldn't go uh, without saying, so I will say it. You know, we have a very, very incredibly white um, profession. We have a very segregated <laughs> economics profession. And the way we approach these topics is very, very problematic. And I, I see this when I talk to a lot of young people who are interested in doing economics, um, particularly young Black people who are interested in doing economics. And they read what these white economists are saying about race, who, who would say themselves that they are about racial inequality, racial equality, and, and are fighting for racial equality. And I will say that I don't think, I'll put it a different way. I think if white economists were really thinking about how black people in general view their research agenda to the extent that one has a research agenda about race, they would seriously rethink a lot of the work that they were doing. I mean, you, you've kind of, I was, I'm aware we're coming up to the hour mark, um, but uh, you, you kind of anticipated what was going to be my final question, which is that, you know, since 2020, when, when the Black Lives Matter protests kind of reignited, there, there did seem to be a sort of reckoning in economics about about around issues of race and i know that you did you wrote that journal of economic perspectives article which you referenced and i i would really recommend that for a really nice overview of some of the things we've been discussing you also wrote the introduction to a special journal of economic literature issue on race um how do you think the discipline is progressing on this front i i am cautiously optimistic i will say this the discussion is now being had, and I don't think that discussion uh, was taking place um, to a large extent before 2020. So to the extent that um, the discussion is a necessary precondition for a more generative research agenda, I believe that those discussions are happening. I, I do want to say, though, that, you know, beginning these discussions and people, you know, on both sides of this say are, are frustrated, it can be very difficult. <laughs> Um, and I know this from experience, to engage people who have been in this research for a very long time and who have been marginalized for their perspectives that they bring to this research. And so one of the things that economists are going to have to confront, but I mean by economists, I mean ma the mainstream of the economics profession, is that not everybody wants to come to the party because you've chosen to extend an invitation at this point. Many people went out and made their own parties and rented the party halls and got the tables and set up the things and put the punch and the cake out and they're having their own party. And they are no longer interested in participating in what the mainstream is doing. And that is something that economists um, will have to struggle with and rest with because those people need to be into and involved in the conversations. Um, and you know, Sam Myers and I have done some work on the marginalization of black scholars and citation networks and a whole lot of other things. And so 
there's a lot of work that needs to be done to repair generations of damage and marginalization of Black economists in particular before this research can really move to the next level. Yeah, that's uh, that seems like a very good, uh, a very good place to close. So, um, Trevon, uh, it's been an hour. Uh, thank you so much for for giving us your time. It's been really fascinating. I feel like we managed to pack quite a lot into into the hour as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, everybody. So uh, I won't I won't stay too much longer. Blood Orange. I'm so um, I'm so sorry that you just arrived, but uh, thanks everybody for for watching. Um, and yeah, this will be uploaded to Unlearning Economics Live as usual tomorrow. Um, and that was yeah, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, there, there, believe me, there were like five, ten questions I didn't even I didn't even ask. So. There's so much to Trevon's work. I'd really check it out. I think um, I'll put it uh, in the Unlearning Economics live description. I'll put like links to some of his main papers that I read before this. Um, anyway, see you all later.